Hello and welcome to another episode of, I don't even know what we call this, <laughs> so my own little episodes on my station station. This is your host, Alan Wyma, and today I have a rather familiar guest for you listeners. It is John Jensett, who is a co-host on the station station and also a Rust educator. John, why don't you go ahead, said, go ahead and say hello from the uh, guest chair today. Hello, Alan. This is, this is a very comfy guest chair you have. Yeah, I, I we were just chatting before the show, and I thought, yeah, it's we should definitely talk about you know you what's going on with you because every time I listen to the Rust Station station, you're always talking about what's going on with Rust. Uh, but you yourself has got a lot of stuff going on yourself. Um, we just chat you know a little bit here and there. Yeah, it's it's been a busy few years. That's true. Yeah, uh, like I said, we just talk talk a little bit here and there over uh, Discord, and um, like I said, the, the last I've heard from you is that you're working. At AWS, and even before that, I, I think you were still in school, and you're working on a, on a database. Like may, maybe you can kind of give a little bit more background about like how you got started with Rust, and, and like what brought you to where you are today. Sure. Yeah. So I um I actually picked up Rust pretty early on in my PhD, where um I, I was starting a new project that eventually turned into what my thesis project was. Um, and I had to pick a language for it. And, and this was when Rust was very new. I like, I think it just entered 1.0. Um, and previously I'd been working in sort of C++. I'd written some stuff in Python. I'd written a decent amount of stuff in Golang. Um, and I'd been frustrated because I like writing low level concurrent, like fast code. And those languages didn't really feel like the right fit somehow, like, C++ just felt ugly um, and Go felt too, like it didn't give me enough knobs to deal with the type system to implement things in a powerful way myself. Um, and, and so when I started reading about Rust, I was like, this seems like an interesting language. I didn't know whether it was going to sort of pan out, but it just, given that I was about to write sort of a high-performance system that was going to be concurrent, I was like, all right, let's 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 try this language and, and give it a, a run for its money. And it just sort of panned out like over the next five years or so. Um, I, I never think I regretted the choice of language. If anything, it, quite to the contrary, it just kept reaffirming itself as the right choice when it catches bugs that I otherwise wouldn't have realized. It was somewhat easy to onboard people onto the project because it was hard for them to implement things incorrectly. I think it was tricky for them to learn the language in the first place, but it was also hard for them to sort of make mistakes as newcomers to the code base. Um, and I think that was a, a benefit. Um, and then I finished that work, which to summarize very briefly was a, uh, a high performance uh, database for read heavy web applications. The idea was to build a database specifically for that use case and then taking advantage of that particular use case to, to optimize the hell out of it, basically, um, for that workload. So I, I finished that and graduated my PhD at the end of uh, last year. So like September of 2020, um, or October, actually. Um, and I, at that point, I wasn't quite sure what to do next. Um, my girlfriend is from the US and, and wanted to stay in the US, at least for, for a bit longer, getting her career started and such. And so I was looking around for work and I, I knew that I wanted to continue working with Rust ideally in a situation where I could help continue to teach Rust. This is, I'd sort of started my live streams by this point and I, I really enjoy that feeling of getting other people um, to sort of learn new things and understand new things about the language. It, that gives me a lot of joy. Uh, and I felt that during my PhD as well, being a teaching assistant and such. And so I wanted a role where I can continue doing that and where I could also continue to give back to the ecosystem. Um, and so that's really what I was looking for in a role. Um, and then when I was chatting to, to Amazon, it seemed like that was a thing that they were also interested in. Like they were sort of willing to give me this room to continue with my educating and to work specifically on the sort of Rust key infrastructure at Amazon. So, so not building things in Rust necessarily, but making sure that the people who build things with Rust have the best possible experience. Um, and that, of course, entails improving Rust itself and in improving the Rust ecosystem. And so that, that appealed to me as like, I can actually work on things that matter here, which means they probably matter elsewhere as well, uh, and sort of do some of that work in the public. 
Um, and and I've been there now since uh, I started November second. So I basically graduated and then had like two days and then started working. So it was uh, no no rest for the wicked. But um, it, it's been really fun. It's been really fun. Um, I'm coming up now on my one year uh, one year mark, and I think so far it's been both an educational experience going into work life, um, but also pretty rewarding. I feel like I've gotten to do many of the things that that I would want to do in sort of a, a work context. Okay, that's there's a couple of things that you talked about that I actually want to go back over. Uh, maybe we can start from the most recent one. Is um, I think I've seen somebody say make it make a voice saying like I don't want AWS to kind of steer Rust. Right. Do you have any kind of uh, words about that? Because I think AWS picked up a lot of people. They got Carl, they got you, uh, quite a few others. Uh, like, do you have any thoughts about this kind of statement? Yeah. I mean, it, it's not, it's not something that it, that I have a lot of control over really. I, I think my high level take here is that for a language like Rust to succeed, it needs to, like, people need to be paid to work on it. Uh, and someone has to pay those people. And, like ideally, that's a lot of companies employing a lot of people to to pull in lots of different directions, and and we get some kind of synergy out of it. Um, and I think it's really good to see AWS um, hire a lot of people to work in the public ecosystem and work on Rust itself. And I think it's it's true that I really wish that there are that there were more companies putting more into this. And I think we are seeing the the early signs of that. Um, so I really just want to continue in that direction. And I don't see it as a bad thing that that AWS is currently like hiring or, or employing a lot of the people working on Rust. Um, I, I don't think that's an indicator that AWS sort of owns Rust in any meaningful sense. I, I think it's more that like they're willing to put money into Rust and and hoping that they sort of set an example, right, for for others to do the same. Yeah, I, I'm just curious if you if you I mean maybe you can't say too much or whatever, right? But it, it is a valid concern that people you know. It's it's like um, I'm not sure what is a valid analogy, um, but yeah, I mean it's kind of like maybe like a, a politician cannot necessarily not listen to one of his biggest backers, right? You, you know, you have to to kind of address those concerns, and that's just kind of like you can't really have your cake and eat it too, right? Um, but I don't think AWS is doing that much, right? Well, it, it's hard for me to speak to because I'm not on the, that particular team that sort of heads the Rust effort. My work is specifically on the the Rust build system internally at, at Amazon and and sort of the contributions to, to Cargo and and Rust from from that perspective. Um, but I I don't really think it's a matter of um, AWS like deciding that we want this thing, so build it right like that. That particular team, the the Rust team, are they're more externally facing. They're not really an internal team that like builds things for Amazon per se. Like they they really are trying to make the Rust language sustainable and push that forward. Um, so uh, I I'm not particularly concerned. Like I think this is um, I think this is still much better than if no one was like if these people weren't hired to work on Rust. Although, although I totally agree that I want more companies to employ more people, uh, so that we get that sort of diversity of the community to to work on Rust, absolutely. Uh, but I don't see it as concerning the way it is now. Okay, that's that's good to hear. Um, yeah, because you always get that warning when I didn't really feel like it was like that. Like, if it was, I think you would be a lot more uproar, and people would really be upset, and everybody would know that's that this is a problem. Yeah, I think well, one one good proxy here. One good proxy here is to sort of ask yourself, are there any specific or general changes that are concerning, right? Like, uh, at least I haven't seen anything that I personally find objectionable that that it feels like AWS is like trumped through. Like, I haven't seen any evidence of that. Um, and I, I don't think that's something those people or that team would do either, because it wouldn't be in the best interest of Rust, which is sort of like it would be counterproductive. And so at least I, I can't point to anything that's like particularly concerning. Okay, that's really good to hear. Um, I did want to go back to your database, right? So you worked on this database for read, high read uh, websites. Now, has this actually been released yet or is it still being worked on even though you left or what's the current status of it? So um, that 
Databiz was entirely a research project, right? Like I didn't build it with the intention of it being like a production ready thing. Um, the, the code is all open source, like it's on GitHub and you can definitely download and run it, but it, it very much has the flavor of being a research prototype. Like I'm sure that if you run it and give it various like MySQL queries or something, they'll be like weird or give you wrong results or it'll panic or something. It, it was it was written specifically to benchmark the applications I had in mind. Um, and that means that there, it's not really a general purpose thing you can just pick up and run. Um, that said, I would love for someone to do that. Like I, I think it is a really, really promising um, both avenue of research and also just um, a product. Like I think it's um, I think it's a good idea to do things this way. I think it leads to just a better experience for application developers where you don't have to implement all this like error prone caching yourself. Um, and, and it would be really nice if this was like a thing that people could actually use. Um, but what I built at the end of my research was just a, a research prototype. What's the name of the, of the code if we can find it online? Oh, it's called uh, Noria. So you can find it on github.com slash MIT dash PDOS, PDOS slash Noria. Um, PDOS is the Parallel and Distributed Operating Systems Group, which is um, the group I was in at MIT when I did my PhD. Why'd you guys choose the name Noria? You know, it was a, <laughs> uh, we went back and forth a lot on names. Uh, we landed on Noria because, so a Noria is like an old term word for old term, old time word for um, a large water wheel that was used to like drive a mill or something using a river. Um, and the reason we chose it was because it sort of matches what Noria does in a very abstract sense of it uses flow as in water flow or in Noria's case, data flow to process things into higher fidelity data, right? So a mill produces flour from wheat, right? And this produces like derived views. So sort of computations over data. Um, so it's a very abstract analogy, but the name sort of stuck because it, it sounds nice too. So it is true that you know, naming is definitely one of the hardest parts in uh, computer, oh, yeah. science, computer yeah. science. There are only two hard, pro hard problems in uh, computer science. It's uh, caching, naming, and off by one errors. <laughs> okay, I get it. Yeah, it, um, yeah. I'm trying to think. Now you... <laughs> Sorry, I'm still waking up over here, and also your 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 smile and the joke is just uh, got me a little bit <laughs> off. Um, but maybe we can get back to kind of like the. Well, let's let's talk actually a little bit more about your, your YouTube channel, right? So like. Uh, I start with a couple of my own. Um, they are, they can be, they can be work, right? To to kind of put put time into them, trying to make them grow, or even just like you know dealing with comments, etc. There is effort involved, right? It's not an easy undergoing. It's not for everybody. So, what kind of got you started that you're just like, hey, you know, I just need to to scratch this itch, or you know, what what was going on in your mind at the time? Oh, I, I don't think I would say that they can be work. I would say they are work. Like they're e even like in my case where I don't do any any editing after I make the video, I just sort of upload it. Um, but it's a lot of work to like some of my videos are six hours of straight coding and. It's like, I have to figure out what I'm going to do a stream on. And then I sit down and do programming for six hours. Like that's non-trivial effort. Um, I think the, the place I came from was back in 2018, there was a, a sort of tw the 2018 Rust survey where, or, or I think it was actually the call for blog posts that the called out that we really need better intermediate teaching resources for Rust. Um, and I, I sort of surveyed briefly on Twitter, like what format would people like to see this in? And and I didn't get too many responses because who listens to a random person on Twitter? Um, but the couple of things I got back were like, oh, we want to read blog posts. And then a couple of people suggested like live coding videos. Um, and I hadn't really thought of that as an option even before, but it, it sparked my interest because it's a little bit different. And it also means that I can show more of the development process. So uh, one thing I, I dislike about blog posts and, and, and books to some extent is that you tend to just show the final result. You can always sort of walk through the code and explain why each piece is there, but it's not quite the same as 
sort of hacking your way through a problem and getting stuck and trying something again or realizing your design doesn't work out and then trying a different approach. And I think that part of the development process is extremely educational and also important to make it to make people understand that we're not all perfect programmers. In fact, none of us are, right? You you will get stuck. You will have to reevaluate your design and, and start over. And that's okay. It's it's in fact normal. Um, and and I like that it, live coding basically conveys exactly that. Um, and, and so I had this sort of spur of the moment decision like, yeah, I'm going to try it and see, see what pants out. Um, and so I ordered a microphone online um, and... When it arrived, that sort of gave me the incentive to, okay, you got to actually do it now because you put money here. Um, and then I just hooked it up to my laptop and just started coding and streaming. And the response was like, people thought this was interesting, which uh, to be honest, surprised me a little bit because I don't think I would find it interesting to watch my own videos because that's not, I don't know that that's how I learn. Um, but maybe that's also because I have so much experience with it now that it's unclear how much of the benefit would be to me. I, I honestly don't know. Um, but it seems like a lot of people found viewing this process start to finish uh, interesting. And so I kept doing it and kept trying to find what are particular areas where I feel like I can highlight a lot of things at once. Because I think that's the other advantage of these live coding videos is that rather than cover just one particular topic or one particular solution, you get to show all of these small tricks that come up in everyday development, whether that's a cool type from the standard library or a particular crate or a particular pattern or a debugging technique. All of them sort of get intermixed. And over the course of two, three, four, five hours, you've covered a lot of ground that's not just related to the particular problem you're trying to solve. In fact, by the end of the stream, you might not actually have built something that works, but there might still be a lot of educational content in there. Um, and so I just kept doing them, and and here we are now, and and people seem to still find them uh, find them useful. Yeah, I've seen people share your your videos a lot on uh, on Reddit, and uh, I found them also. And so like when when I saw like okay, you know, oh this is you know this is who this guy is, okay, because because obviously your your last name is extremely uh, distinct. Um, yeah, it's handy. <laughs> Yeah, so so when you see, well, not many people have G J. You know, it's a little bit like, well, how the heck do you say that, say that? But but yeah, it's obviously it's it's Jen said after you, you taught me. But uh, but in general, um, yeah. And then then I saw you're you're, you're actually uh, on this podcast, and so oh, okay, this is who this guy is. Okay, now I know a little bit more about you know what his background is. Um, and would you say like you're you're basically your biggest contribution, or at least maybe your your first contribution is actually uh, in in Rust is the um. Is your own YouTube channel or your podcast or would you, what would you say? That That's hard to answer um, because I feel like I've made contributions in like smaller contributions in a bunch of different ways. Like I don't think my streams are a big contribution. Um, I don't think the podcast is a big contribution. Uh, I've made some changes to like the Rust standard library itself. I've made um, some like design implications for Tokyo, the like asynchronous runtime. Um, so, so I've like worked on a little bit all over the place, um, and uh, I guess taken together that means that now like uh, I've had some kind of impact. I, I think I am probably best known now for for teaching Rust. I think the the podcast is something that particularly interested parties pick up and listen to, um, and the contributions sort of get lost over time because they're like these are constantly evolving ecosystems and. There are lots of great contributors over time, and the fact that I contributed some things back in the day does not really make a difference now. And, and that's sort of how it should be. Like, I don't think we should have these singular heroes that stay heroes throughout. Not that I was a hero at all, but but like, I, I think it's important that we let new people come in and teach. Um, uh, but I do think that where I spend now the majority of my time and effort is on uh, education, both both through the streams and through the the book that I've been writing. And I think in part it's because I, I really enjoy that part of things. Um, I, I find, I just find a lot of joy in in sort of spreading that that knowledge and, and getting the sense that people understand more after than before. Um, 
that that gives me a, a sense of accomplishment. Yeah. Do you, do you ever have some questions that people ask you, and you're really just like, "Oh my, actually, I really have no idea." <laughs> it it does it does happen. Um, I I think at this point, those are usually questions that aren't really related to the language, that are related to the ecosystem or a particular library that I haven't used, or to um, like functionality that's still in like RFCs or things from like academic papers or systems design, like things where they just require a lot more thinking. I, I feel like I know the language decently well now, but there are corners of Rust that I just cannot follow either. Um, like, or, or where I would really have to like sit down and, and read in detail before I could feel like I could answer the question. Like I think some of the amazing work that uh, Ralph Jung has been doing on like formalizing Rust semantics and the borrow checker and stuff is like very, I don't know they're advanced is the right word, but it's just a different way to talk about Rust that I'm not used to, even though it has really important implications for the, the safety of the language itself. Um, and some of it is still like kind of unknown, right? Like it's, it's still an active area of research, like, uh, the whole notion of like stacked borrows and how to deal with pointer provenance and rust. These are deep, complicated topics that I feel like I have a, a general grasp on, but if I get deep technical questions, I, I would have to look it up as much as any other person, maybe ex except Ralph. Uh, I wanted to go back to your YouTube channel and, uh, I was just kind of browsing through and, it seems like you have some kind of like mini shows in here, right? Uh, obviously, you have typical Q&A, uh, but you also have uh, Unsafe Chronicles, which there's only one video in there, but I can imagine there could be quite a few. Uh, but one that always sticks out is the uh, crust of rust. Like, where did this title come from? And like, what would make a video be in the crust of rust versus just a video? So, so crust of rust came up um, because... I got some some feedback from a decent number of people who were like, your videos are too long. I can't follow like six hours of programming. Like you need to do something about it. And I, I understand that criticism. Like it is a long amount to, to watch someone do anything. Um, but I, I don't think it's the time that really got to me, but more the observation that there are some topics that are like intermediate level topics that are hard to understand. And you don't really cover them completely in any of the videos. Or if you do, it's really hard to find, right? Something like uh, pinning, like how does pinning work? Or something like subtyping invariance. Like this is a complicated, hairy topic. Can you do a video just on that topic? Um, and I figured it sort of fits within my niche of like intermediate rust. Um, but I also realized that it's hard to do a, a sort of implementation, like a live coding stream on them, because this is more almost like a lecture than it is like, let's build a project. Uh, and so with Crust of Rust, what I wanted to do was start a series of somewhat shorter, but still very thorough videos that cover a particular topic, like to death. Like I want you to, if you have a question about this area, you look up this video, you watch the whole thing as if you were sitting through like a university lecture, and now you know that thing really well. Um, and still sort of based in, in, in pragmatic teaching. Like I want to show people code. I want to sort of give them an intuition for what happens behind the scenes and like why this is useful and why this is important. So they still end up being, I think, about two hours each. Um, but but they are more concise and more focused on a particular area than the other videos are. The the name actually came out of the first stream I did. Um, I, I asked the people watching, like, what should I call this? I got lots and lots and lots of different suggestions. But Crust of Rust just sort of stuck with me as as the best one that came up. Um, and I, I forget now who initially suggested it, but it was like basically some some random person watching the videos, and I was just like, "That sounds exactly right. Let's go with it." Okay, I'm just trying to think why why the word crust. Every time I think about crust, I think about pizza crust. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. Yeah. So the the reason why I, I went with that was because this is not the the meat of rust, right? Like it's not the main stuff. This is the stuff that's a little bit more at the fringes, like at the edges. They're niche uh, niche things that you don't really need to know most of the time. But if you're really like pushing at the edge of Rust, this is where you end up. So it's the edge of Rust, and it's like crispy topics. Like they're they're like crunchy for the brain. Um, and so it's like a sort of like a pizza crust. 
uh, or like a pie crust is really what I was going for because they're it's a little bit sweet too. Um, and so crust of rust it was. Got it, got it. Okay. Yeah, I, and I, now that uh, you're talking about this, I, I actually have another kind of question. So um, as I stated quite a few times, I'm still getting into rust. I don't know if I can ever actually say I'm I'm a rustation or, or whatever. I don't even know how, uh, what, when you when you know that you can say you're comfortable with rust because it's like you always, there's always, like you said, something that you don't know. Right. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if you've re- read um, Nico Matsaki's recent post on how to be a rustation. Um, no, I didn't. So I thought that was a really interesting. It's not like a, a an answer. Like it's not if you do this, you're a rustation. If you don't, you're not. But more sort of guiding principles of like here are things that rustations believe or value or think is important. Um, and it doesn't really give like a line for once you're over this, you are a restation. But what what I have in my mind, at least, is that you're a restation once you um, once you're using Rust uh, either actively or actively trying to learn it. I don't think you need to be super knowledgeable in Rust in order to to know Rust. But it's sort of like if you read the Rust book, then I think you're a restation. Like, I think that's how sort of inclusive we should be, if not even more. Like, there are people who read half the book and then go do a bunch of exercises. You're still a rustation. It's just maybe the measuring stick is if you consider yourself a rustation, uh, then you are a rustation. If you think you might be a rustation, then you're also a rustation. It's a very deep, deep topic you just brought up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we, again, we were chatting before the actual show. Um, you got started. So what I understand was, let's, let's get back to the meat, meat of the topic, right? Maybe we could say the crust of this episode is really about, well, I guess it, actually it's more like the pie filling, right? Because this is really going to be the title, I hope, um, is about your book, right? So you mentioned before that there is beginner content, there's advanced content. Actually, somebody wrote that on, on, on the Nubstarch website uh, as a review or comment on your book is saying that there's beginner, there's advanced uh, but there is no intermediate, right? So what what actually makes the biggest question on my head is like, what's an intermediate topic? How do like it's to me that's like a gray area, right? Yeah, it it really is, and and this is something that the the editors of No Starch were, I don't want to say debating with me because that's not really what happened, but more they were trying to get me to articulate what does intermediate mean here, because as you say, it's sort of a, a gray area. It's Anything that's not advanced or beginner. To me, intermediate is the the bridge that connects I don't know this well to I know this well. That's intermediate. So um, an example would be, let's say we're talking about um, asynchrony, right? You might sort of have used the async await keyword, um, and you kind of know what it is, but you feel like it's sort of a fuzzy concept. Like you, you couldn't really explain it in detail to someone, uh, which to me means you're a beginner. Uh, the advanced would be, you know, how all the nuts and bolts of async and await works. Uh, you know, how like executors work and you know how they interact, you know, of the pitfalls and gotcha. You've like worked with it for a while. You know how to get good performance out of it. Like at that point, I think you're advanced. An intermediate to me is the path from one to the other. It's all of the little things that you need to learn to get from one to the other. And the those things are not necessarily complicated. This is why I didn't want it to be like difficult topics or anything, because I think it's really just a collection of knowledge that you sort of accumulate over time as you go from beginner to advanced or experienced or whatever you want to call it. Um, because if if you look at the way the book is structured too, is really structured as let me teach you or or try to demonstrate to you the things that I've learned about this topic over several years. Um, and once you know those things, you should now feel comfortable about how things fit together, or at least be able to understand how they fit together, and then maybe explain it to others. Um, so intermediate to me really is that that bucket of knowledge that you build up over time as you go from beginner to experienced. Yeah, like now you mentioned it. So I'm just looking at the the um the table the TOC table of contents. Um yeah, I, I do have the early access one. Uh, of course we talked about this before your chapter one's missing and that, that makes sense once you explained to me that yeah you can't really write 
the intro without knowing what the rest of the book is. Got it. Um, but yeah, looking at the other topics like foundations, it's interesting you talk about memory because, yeah, I mean, memory is kind of like, it's important, but not a lot of people actually talk about it because, yeah, there is some extractions, right? Like when you say box, it's not really saying that this is going to the heap, although I, I know that it's doing that. Um, I mean, I think a really good question to talk about would be like, why would everyone want to put an int on the heap? What's the what's the point of that? I'm, I'm hoping that you go into that. I haven't looked at all of it yet. Um Oh yeah, FFI, you know, foreign function interface. So, so the reason why I wanted to cover memory early on in the book is because I think a lot of Rust is about memory, um, or, or rather, the reason why Rust does many of the things can be explained by we need to deal with the realities of memory. Um, and I think as a programmer, if you come into trying to learn learn those intermediate things about Rust, and you don't have a solid understanding of the memory model you're working in or that Rust tries to target, you're going to have a real hard time under not necessarily understanding the mechanism, but understanding why they're there, understanding the motivation for it. And I think if you don't understand the motivation, if you don't see why, like, why references have a lifetime or why there's a difference between the stack and the heap, if you don't have that understanding, you're just not going to feel like you get it for when we talk about more advanced things like lifetimes or, or reference counting or automatic dropping or unsafety and aliasing, right? Like those things all rely on this fundamental knowledge. And I think it's something that many programmers have an incomplete understanding of. And the book doesn't try to give you a complete understanding either, but it tries to give you enough of an understanding that you can understand the all of the various intermediate things that we cover later on in the book. Basically, so that you have all the, the building blocks, or, or maybe more accurately, so that you have all of the hooks that you can hang the later concepts onto um, in order to sort of really understand how it all fits together. That's also why the chapter is called Foundations, because I think you, you need to know these things in order to understand all the rest, because they're really, these are the components that we have to build the language out of. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of typical modern programming languages, they don't really talk about stack and heap. It seems like only when you work with C, C++, they talk about it. Well, it's partially because in, in most other programming languages, except for like C and C++, you don't really need to think about it, right? Like in Go, you have automatic escape analysis that determines whether something should be on the stack or the heap. In Java, basically everything is on the heap. Not quite true, but, but kind of close. Um, in... Uh, like Python and Ruby, all the interpreted languages, like everything is just allocations that are automatically managed for you. So it doesn't really matter. And therefore you don't need to understand the difference. It's not, it doesn't impact you as a programmer. And so you don't, it's not a, a concept that's important. In C and C++ it is because if you don't understand those topics, your code will like seg fault because your pointers aren't valid anymore. In Rust, it's important because your code won't compile if you don't get this right. Uh, I, I would argue the Rust model is better than the C++ model here in that I would rather have a compiler error than a seg fault, uh, but here many people disagree. Um, but to me, that, that's part of the value proposition that Rust forces you to learn these things um, because they are fundamental to the programming model once you give up things like automatic memory management. Um, I think th there was a great quote at, um, at RustConf this year that Rust um, Rust gives you the headache first compared to other languages. Uh, and I think that's a that's a good take on it, that it makes you do all your thinking ahead of time or much of the thinking ahead of time, which is maybe a trade-off programmers often aren't used to, but that Rust makes very explicitly that choice to, to do it that way. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, you, you said something that made me a little bit surprised. So you're saying people actually would rather have a seg fault during runtime than to have a compile error? To me, it, the latter seems much better because you'd want a program that keeps running, right? Nobody wants a program that says, oh, if something bad happens, just crash. Like, like, like that's obviously a typical, that's a programming model of something that has like green threads, like, a, like Erlang, something like that. That makes sense to me, but saying that, oh, this low level thing I wanted to just, seg fault, uh, and so I can just kind of feel happy that it compiled? Is that the understanding I got? So, I, okay, the let me try to rephrase phrase that a little bit. So you understand me correctly. Um, what I meant was I think many, many developers um, would rather their code just compile 
and run and then debug if it crashes later. And I think part of this is because they're overly confident that it won't crash later. And so if you give them an error at compile time, they go, this is not a problem. Why is the compiler not just doing what I tell it to? I agree with you that it's better to have the compiler tell you, no, this is wrong. But there is a, a little bit of a balance here, which is um, if you're trying to build a product or if you're trying to build some program of some kind and you just want it to like get out there and run, it doesn't matter if there's a particular extremely unlikely case where something goes wrong because you probably won't hit it. Now, I think that's an insane position to take, but in general, I think, especially for things like prototyping, it is a hindrance to getting something that you can run, right? If you think about it as a, as a programmer who's in the process of developing something new, whether that is a new program from scratch or new functionality, um, very often, I want to run the thing to see that it's doing the right thing in the first place. It doesn't matter to me whether the borrow checker works out if my sorting algorithm is just wrong in the beginning, right? I would rather have it compile and then run it and see that it doesn't actually sort anything and then figure out why that is than I would like to figure out the lifetimes. Like that's not important in the early stages. Um, and I think that is maybe where it's a little bit more of a gray area, whether it's actually good that it forces you to do that ahead of time. Um, I think for for the like final thing, like when you are actually going to ship this somewhere, it's going to run in production or serve real user traffic or something. At that point, you do want it to be correct, even in the corner cases. But but it's the development process up to there where I think developers would rather have it just run, at least in some cases. From all my years of helping clients to write their software and this idea of POC, there's just no POC. It's just, oh, this looks great. This one's great for me in my cases. Let me just put that online. And then when it does crash, then they say, well, don't you know what the heck you're doing? We did discuss yep. this POC, right? You said this is not going out. And they said, no, no, no. It really worked great when we were using it together. Why don't you, why do you write buggy software? <laughs> yeah, this is a, this is a very common problem, right? That people take, if, if you build something that works, people will just use it. Um, which is the downside of ever prototyping anything because you built a thing that works, so just ship it. There's too much of a temptation to not redo the work. And in some sense, Rust doesn't let you make that choice. It's not quite true, but like, it won't compile unless you did it right. Also an overgeneralization, but at least to a greater extent that, than many of these other languages. Uh, sorry, another question came to my mind. So I was watching uh, one of your videos um yesterday i forgot which one it was but it was one with with white background and black text yeah i'm sorry i couldn't remember exactly which one it was but it, it was talking about uh why why you should use rust i think uh but yeah oh so I just this is the that, considering is rust talk ago. yeah that's the one yeah see now she mentioned it now i remember the name because you're really talking all about rust um and you did make a, a statement saying like okay if if the who was it I forgot what, what, now I can't remember exactly what the statement was, but it was something along the lines of like, if it can compile, then you can basically trust that's okay. If you have these unsafe blocks, then that's where your issues usually lie. Uh, but I have heard that there is still ways that you could still, um, you know, have issues even with safe rust. Like, uh, there, there's ways that you could still have like, um, uh, memory that doesn't actually get cleaned up and things like that. Is that, is that case still true oh, sure. or am I remembering wrong? No, no, that's totally true. So there, like Rust does not eliminate all bugs. Um, and anyone who claims that it does is is either lying or confused. Um, what Rust does is it eliminates a very particular class of errors, and that is memory safety errors, um, which is a very, it's a an important, but it definitely a subset of application errors. For example, it doesn't prevent you from having business logic errors, right? Like if your logic says, I don't know, imagine you're implementing a bank and your logic says you can only spend money if you have money in your account and you got like the greater than or equal sign the wrong way around, then yes, Rust won't save you from your check not being correct. Um, and similarly, it won't prevent you from leaking memory. Like if you create a, a like two reference counted pointers that point to each other, then Rust won't deallocate that memory because the reference count is always two and will stay two forever, um, which coincidentally is also the reason why uh, 
mem forget in Rust is considered a safe function. It's not an unsafe function. It's because leaking memory is not unsafe because you can always do it in, in these other ways. Um, the, the classes of bugs that Rust eliminates are memory safety errors, which are things like uh, letting you treat one type as a different type that is not its actual type. Right, like if I have a type foo and you treat it as type bar, but foo wasn't a bar, so that's just illegal. Um, or anything that's like undefined behavior by the compiler or or the uh, the linker. So the, these are things like um, booleans in Rust have to be either zero or one. You cannot have a boolean that's a two that has a, a like a bit value of two. And the reason for this is there are optimizations in the compiler that optimize by taking advantage of the fact that those are the only two valid bit values for bools. So if you ever wrote a program that tried to put a three into a bool, you would end up with memory safety errors because it would be undefined behavior because the compiler might try to take advantage of an optimization that's no longer sound. Um, and those kinds of errors are the ones that Rust prevents in safe Rust. Um, but that doesn't mean that it eliminates all of these other classes of errors like, like memory leaks. Yeah, that's what I'm. I'm actually really, really interested to know more about, like, what kinds of bugs can Rust not help you with. So there is, like you said, a, if you use uh, reference counting and they point to each other, that one could could be a memory leak. Like, is there anything else that comes off the top of your head which people should be aware of? Um, I mean, I think I I wouldn't think about it that way around. I would think about it as Rust has all the same potential for bugs as other languages, except that. It does not allow memory safety errors. It does not allow uh, data races. So this is like uh, concurrent mutable access to a shared memory location. Um, and those are really the only two things that the Rust language prevent at like a language level you from doing. All other bugs can still happen. Now, Rust has an additional, there's an additional clause in there, which is that Rust has a very expressive type system which means that very often you can write APIs and uh, functions and method signatures so that they are hard to misuse. An example of this would be the, the mutex type or the lock type in Rust, which wraps the protected value. So you can only get at the lock protected value by taking the lock. If you don't take the lock, you don't have any way of getting at the value. In other languages, this is not usually true. Like in Go, for example, there's a mutex type, but the mutex type does not hold anything. It is just an object in and of itself. And so you store the value that's protected by the lock separately from the lock. So there's nothing that enforces that you take the lock in order to access the value. And so you can have these erroneous cases where you have some code that just forgot to take the lock. In Rust, that cannot happen because the type system lets us express that you must take the lock in order to get at the value. Um, but that's more a result of an expressive type system than it is sort of a property of the language. That's a little bit scary now that I'm thinking about it because I'm thinking about all these people. There's a lot of people in, uh, in Hong Kong where, I'm at, where I am that really love Go and push it and are a little bit dismissive of Rust. And uh, and the more I see, like, I, I saw a guy on YouTube basically show, like, two programs and, like, he kind of wrote them the same way. And, yeah, Rust wouldn't compile at all with this concurrent access, but Go would, and it would just keep segfaulting all the time. And to me, that's just, like, a horrible experience. And if you see a segfault, you may not, I mean, if you if you don't know how to debug your stuff uh, properly, which is definitely can happen, like, if you're, maybe beginner to intermediate, then you may never actually understand why is that my code is uh, not working. Yeah, and I, I make this argument in the in the book too, when I talk about unsafe, that I'm not actually that concerned about segfaults um, because segfaults means that your program stopped running. What I'm concerned about is incorrect behavior but your program kept running. Those are the scary cases, right? Like uh, as the example we talked about where you have a, mutex is separate from the data. Well, if you forget to take the lock, but you still access the data, that value may end up getting corrupted. Imagine that value is someone's like bank balance. This is a huge problem. Suddenly like someone's bank balance just changed to a random value or semi-random in some way. That's not okay. But if your program doesn't crash, you don't even know that this happened. And now your program just keeps running with corrupted data in it. Or imagine that it like, 
silently corrupts your backups. You won't know that this is the case until the next time you try to restore from a backup, at which point it might be too late. Those are the error cases that I'm worried about. And, and those are, are some of the reasons why I think it's so important to handle as much safety as you can at compile time. And I think this is where we get into the, la the land of like formal verification and, and the languages that are designed around that. So these are, are languages like Daphne or, or Coq that, that both let you write formal specifications for what is correct behavior of this program and let you actually check that the implementation perfectly matches that specification. R Rust doesn't go that far. Um, and I, I think I think Rust strikes a pretty good balance between compile time safety and like pragmatic implementation efficiency. Um, but but I do like that in Rust you can encode many of these correctness invariants in the type system and, and have them be checked at compile time. I, I think that's a really valuable um, uh, property of the language. I was just thinking in my head, like, what if you were at a small bank, right? And you put in Rust and all of a sudden your small bank gets a bunch of assets underneath control, right? Let's say like they suddenly went from millions of dollars under under control to now trillions, right? And you had a type that just couldn't handle that big, like obviously, like in, I think in C, like it just kind of wraps around and you could go to negative. In Rust, uh, I'm sure that gets caught somehow, right? Would you actually get a seg fault in this case since it did wrap around? Or would yep. you just keep going on? So we actually get a seg fault? Well, it's complicated. Um, so in general, in Rust, um, wraparounds or overflows cause a panic. I forget whether this happens in release mode. I know it happens in debug mode. I think it also happens in release mode now, but I'm not sure. Um, but what Rust does is there is a, a method on integer types that is specifically wrapping arithmetic. Like you say, wrapping add. And that's how you express that I want to do a wrapping add where don't panic if it overflows. Um, there's also, I think, a wrapper type around the integer types that you can use if you want regular arithmetic to always wrap. Um, but in general, an, an overflow is considered an error. Same with an underflow, and, and will cause a panic. I'm just trying to think about what when would the heck would I want to actually wrap instead of you know throwing a panic. Um, it happens. So, for example, if you implement TCP, um, the sequence numbers for packets wrap around because um, every sequence number indicates a particular byte offset in the stream. And so if you ever stream, say, more than two gigabytes of data, then you're going to wrap around 32 bits, um, which is all you have for sequence numbers in most cases of TCP, in some cases even like 16 bits. So you're just you're going to have to wrap around. Um, and so that's an example where like the protocol dictates that this is a, a wrapping addition or an overflowing addition. So there are cases, like if you have known limited size values where overflow is explicitly handled. Okay. Yeah, your book so far, like I said, it, when you explained about intermediate, I think you're definitely in that area, right? Because when you're a beginner, you're probably not doing FFI uh, and definitely not getting into macros, I think. But I think once you start working more and more, you may want to create your own macros or maybe even just dig into why a macro isn't working or how it actually works just so you can understand what's going on. Yeah, and, and I, I, I wrote the book very specifically so that the chapters are independent. You read the chapters that you care about. It's possible to read the book start to finish, but like if you care about macros, read the macro chapter. You don't have to read the FFI chapter if you don't care about FFI. Read the chapters that are interesting to you and, and skip the rest. And, and that should be totally fine. I'm actually kind of curious why you went into no standard, right? I think that's a very particular case, right? From what I understand, if, if I understand correctly, because this is not in the, in, in the version I have, uh, no standard would be something like where you actually don't have an OS, right? And then you have, like, you're just working with bare metal, so like an Arduino or something of the sort. So why would you actually go into that in an intermediate uh, part? Because it is a very common use of Rust for things like embedded development, uh, whether that's for, it's used a lot for robots and robotics. Um, it's used in embedded, like, sensor development. Um, it's used in certain cases, if you want to do things like smart contracts in Rust, then you probably don't want to pull into the standard library. Um, so in general, NoSTUD is used a fair amount, but it's used in particular niches of development. 
And, and again, this is why the chapters are written to be independent, because there is a decent number of people who really care about that niche, um, but they don't care about like macros. This is not interesting to them or async because they can't use async in their context, um, but they really care about Nostad. So, so the book really tries to give you that, that intermediate knowledge bucket for each of these different um, large niches, if you will, which is a little bit of an oxymoron, but... Close enough. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, um, I think the last question I kind of had about about your book was, um, yeah. So now that the book is ready to go, right? Is there uh, a next thing that you wanted to to dig into, like if there a next next endeavor? Because obviously, writing a book is not simple. Even though, like, I do remember you did say, oh, actually, I started writing work on this book before we even talked to a publisher. So, like, what's your next on your kind of agenda? Um. I've been thinking about that. I don't really know yet. I, I think what I want to do is focus on my videos for now um, because I think they are a really good teaching resource and I, there's still a lot more I want to do, um, both in terms of the implementation videos, but also in terms of Crust of Rust. Um, you also mentioned that I had the series called Unsafe Chronicles that I only have one episode of. And there, I think there are a lot more episodes that could be really interesting. I just haven't had the time. Um, and so I think realistically, now that I'm not writing the book, I might find more time to stream and to cover more of those topics. And I think that's probably where I'm going to go next. Um, I'm also in a little bit of a weird position because um, I used to be on a student visa in the US and now I'm on an H-1B work visa. And neither of them really allow you to be employed in any meaningful sense apart from your primary employer. Uh, so I can't like... Uh, I can't start a Patreon, for example. I can't uh, write a Rust class for Coursera or anything like it. Th those are just, they're not legal for me to do. Um, I'm allowed to produce just free content that I just put out there, but I can't make any money off of it. I can't, um, I can't sort of sustain myself on it, which makes, it makes my options a little bit limited. It doesn't make it impossible for me to do something like build a, a Rust course, um, but it means that I would just, have to do it all in the open and not sort of get anything back from it. And I'm not opposed to doing that. It just means that my I need to think a little bit more carefully about what I do when and, and how I spend my time. Um, and it's unfortunate. Like, uh, yeah, I, I, I wish that those weren't the rules, but they are. Um, but, but that said, I think like my videos, for example, will just op always be open and free because I think that's what they should be. Um, ideally, I, I want my book to eventually be open as well. Um, but like there are some realistic limits around like the publishers need to make money and the editors. Like there was a lot of work that went into this that's not just me. Um, but like I, I, I want as much of, as possible of this content to be sort of publicly available. And, and ideally, that's something that, um, that I can find ways to continue doing while also sustaining myself. Yeah, I understand. Uh, okay, one of my questions just came back to me. Um, so uh, I actually do a lot of Elixir. I think I say that quite a few times on here. And I think that if I wanted to dig deep into uh, more advanced topics, uh, there's a lot of material written in Erlang itself. So I'd actually have to dig back into Erlang and then therefore kind of translate the, I, I mean, the ideas in there, everything is there. I just need to know how it works in Erlang, then I just use my mind to kind of translate it to uh, to the Elixir syntax or maybe kind of use some more specialized pieces, et cetera. Now I'm thinking to myself, and this is also something I actually had myself posted on Reddit itself in my thought process is like, if I really want to get into more advanced topics uh, using Rust, like actually building some drivers or whatever, right? Would it make sense for me to actually look at uh, you know, basically the grandfather I was called like C, C++ or even languages before or even after that, maybe even D to get a better idea. Or is that kind of wasting my time because things are just not the same? Like, you know, taking that idea of, oh, you have to, you know, like, I mean, obviously we're talking about heap and stack, but would you think that's a good idea? Or would you think that's kind of like flooding my mind with bad concepts? Uh, I don't think those other languages give you a better understanding of Rust. Um, I think realistically, if you wanted to understand Rust things better, the answer is to like read the standard library, like the relevant parts of the standard library. Um, read like the Rustonomicon, which goes through a lot of these like deep dark corners of Rust. Um, 
go in and like read the source code of some of the the crates that you use. Um, things like uh, sin or surdy or um, this error or anyhow. Like these are really good crates where they're written really well. The code is good and like just read a lot of that low level code that you can then pick up the the contents from. I think if you read other languages, it's not clear that they have topics that really translate. And the one that that do translate, I don't know that I don't know that the the primitives really match enough for you to just sort of carry it over. Um, now that said, I think algorithms and data structures is an exception here. Um, algorithms and data structures are usually mostly program independent, uh, with the exception of memory reclamation for concurrent systems. Um, there, you can usually just sort of translate it in your head. Um, but but in terms of actual code, I think I, I don't know that a guide on how to do something in C++ would really tell you that much on about how to do it in Rust. Uh, D maybe like D and Zig might. I, I was thinking more like um, like if I wanted to make a bootloader, right? I don't know if there's many things in many topics written about bootloaders in Rust. But there's, there's a great blog series by Philip Opperman on writing an OS in Rust that goes through the whole process of like booting a computer and getting all the way into Rust. Uh, but but that said, as, uh, like it's a good example, right? So so for bootloaders or, or generally just for booting a computer, there are a lot of resources for C development on like OS dev, for example. Um, the, the, those are great resources and, and those definitely translate to Rust. But in my mind, at least, those aren't about a programming language, right? Like they're not about C. They're about like assembly to some degree, but but more about the sort of machine primitives that are needed to to bootstrap the hardware. Um, when you say C plus plus, I think of more like here's a design pattern in C plus plus or in Java, for example, or like um, here's how you write a multi-threaded HTTP server in C plus plus. I don't think that translates well to Rust. Now there there might be mechanisms that translate, right? Like maybe you want to use the ePoll system call or something. Like th those maybe translate, but but the, I don't know that that would be a good way to pick up the Rust way to do things. It might give you inspiration, but I think that's where it ends. All right, so you can. It's it's a good idea to use C, C++ or any kind of other language for implementation or or algorithm ideas, but. If you really want to learn Rust, it's not a good idea to look at those languages. It's what the, the gist of this is. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's a that's a fair summary. Um, like I do think that if you're coming from C, you might have a better understanding of like how memory works, maybe. But that I wouldn't suggest that you should therefore go learn C in order to learn how memory works. I think you could just learn it directly in Rust, and that's a better path for you forward. So that top that question is actually one of my forgotten questions. So it's slowly coming back. As you can see, I'm, I'm actually having my morning coffee over here. So uh, <laughs> it's slowly coming back to me. Uh, my last kind of question is, uh, this is brought up by the first guest I had on, uh, Daniel Sternberg, and of course, this is brought up by Linus. Uh, like, what actually happens in panics and rust we, we doing with memory? And, like, and why is there such an uproar? And I think there's currently something being done about this, right? What I actually understood was that when you have a panic, uh, everything unwinds is the word I've seen, which I'm thinking that it actually should deallocate memory and you wouldn't have a leak, but it's not actually true. Uh, so so the problem is the problem is slightly different. Um, the at least my understanding of the complaint from Linus, which is an entirely fair one, is that the kernel shouldn't crash. Like it's not okay to crash the kernel because the computer crashes. And so if you fail to allocate memory, you need to handle it gracefully. Um, and Rust doesn't make that super easy because in general, all of the memory backed operations in Rust are infallible. Like they, if you do something like vec.push, it doesn't return a result. It just happens. Like there's no way for you to know that you ran out of memory because what happens under the hood is that push, if it needs to, tries to allocate more memory. And if it fails to allocate more memory, it panics. Which, as you say, unwinds, which does deallocate memory and drop variables and stuff and run destructors in general. But the problem is that it keeps unwinding, 
right? So it would unwind through the kernel and the kernel would crash. And that's not the behavior you want. Now, you could like write a pa- like catch panics around every time you did any memory operation in Rust. But realistically, that's like you're just going to forget. You're not going to remember to do this everywhere. Um, and so really the the ask was, we need fallible versions of all potentially allocating operations. This is like vec reserve, uh, vec push, uh, string append, uh, in hash map insert, like any operation that could potentially allocate needs to have a sort of try version of the method that returns an error if memory allocation failed. And that way you get to rely on the normal Rust type system to inform you that like here you got a result back and you're not handling the error case. And then ideally for something like the kernel, what you would do is you would say, disallow the use of any infallible method. So that if someone tried to use vec push, it would just say like, you can't use this method or this method does not exist. there's a lot of discussion on how do we actually achieve this, um, and I don't think we fully have the answers yet. But step one is to add fallible versions of all these methods in the first place. Part of what, where this gets challenging, right, is imagine that you're using uh, a library from crates.io that implements some algorithm or data structure or whatever. If you try to use that in the kernel, how do you know that it doesn't use an infallible memory operation and that it might panic? So you end up having to be paranoid everywhere. And so really what you would like to have is like a flag you can pass to the compiler saying, just pretend that the infallible versions do not exist. And so anything that tries to use on them, use any of them will not compile. And that way you know that if the kernel compiles, it doesn't have like memory allocation panics. Every, every memory allocation error is handled gracefully. Uh, and it's it's an entirely correct uh, complaint, right? That we're just not going to accept something into the kernel that doesn't have this behavior. That is an interesting problem to solve considering Rust is Rust, like one of the main pillars, right? Is that we don't want to break stuff in the past. Well, I don't think you need to break anything in the past, right? The, the way you do this is you add new methods that are the fallible versions. Um, and then you add a way to disable the fallible versions. It's, it's, it almost becomes like a, a variant of no stud right, of like no infallible. Uh, and if you set that in a crate, then it will disallow the use of the fallible methods, the infallible methods anywhere in the dependency tree. And so there's no backwards incompatibility, right? Like it's not like your code compiled yesterday, but it doesn't compile today. It's that if you tell the compiler and force this property for me, it will enforce the property for you going forward. Okay, but but then my question goes back to like, okay, let's say you're using, okay, let's say, we got left pad error again, right? Where everybody's kind of depending upon this package. It just works. And then someday we have that issue. And let's say it does allocate memory. Um, and it, it's not using the fallible version. Uh, and you want to use that package. Then what would be your option? Would be what to fork it and then use and then uh, add in that. Uh, but, but that's not a backwards incompatibility, right? Like there's no backwards incompatibility here. That crate never promised that it wouldn't use memory. Um, the, you could imagine that um, just like with no stud today, right? there is usually a feature flag that you set if you want to use the standard library dependencies and you it's on by default, but you can turn it off. Or rather, the other way around. No, yeah, it, there's a feature for the standard library. You can turn it on and it's on by default. Um, and you can sort of opt out of it if you don't, wanna, don't want to use it. You can imagine something similar, right? Of, Um, the crate tries to only use the fallible methods by default, and then it can provide a more ergonomic API if the the infallible feature flag is set. Um, And now that becomes a part of that crate's public API. And if they ever started using um, infallible methods, they would only use them behind the infallible feature flag. And so anyone who didn't want that flag would not be affected by the change. And if they wanted to remove that flag, it would be a breaking change. But that still doesn't answer the, the question of like, if I want to use this library, which doesn't have that feature flag, then I could just not use it. I, I just, basically the only thing I could do is just fork it, 
and create a version that would work with mine. Okay, so that's that's the, the answer I was looking for. But I mean, this is a this is a fundamental problem, right? It's it's not really about breaking changes. It's just if no one has written the code that you need, you will need to write the code. Okay, that that's what I was curious about. If there's a way that somehow we could use this. No, I I don't think they're planning to add like a magically make infallible memory allocations fallible. I, I don't think that's the path they're going down, and it's not really like. It's not really the Rust way of doing things. In general, Rust tends to be explicit over implicit and sort of say, if you return a result, you need to say that you're returning result. Actually, as somebody who's still kind of picking up Rust, like the one thing that I can't seem to figure out is like, how can I find feature flags for a particular crate? Because I never really found that clear. Like the biggest thing that like everybody, when you want, when you want to use survey, you want to use the, the macro, the derived macro or the deserialization series. And it's not clear to me, like I have to turn it on in, in the Tomble file. And well, now I know because once you get bit by it, then you never forget, right? So like, how can somebody see what feature flags are available? Uh, I don't know if this is covered in a book somewhere or what, but I just had never seen to find this. So I don't know that there is a good um, source for this. In general, like most of the larger crate document this like in their documentation. Um, like usually the the docs.rs page for the crate will say like, this is only available behind this feature. And I know that there are some improvements to Rust dog coming as well that, that lets you mark individual like methods and modules and macros with like a little badge that says, this is only available if you have this feature set. Um, I think on docs.rs now, there is a feature flags like menu item like if you go to docsrs slash um, surdy, on the top bar, there's a little button that says feature flags. And when you click that, it'll tell you um, all of the features that are available. Um, it's still a little bit underspecified. Like I wish we had a way, for example, to write documentation directly on a feature. Um, that's not something we have today, but it's something that like could totally end up there someday. But at the moment, it really is sort of up to the... Um, the authors of each library to document their features in the the crate level documentation. Okay, so it's not so there's so there's no special thing. Okay, I thought that was just me because I feel like everybody out there knows all the feature flags or there's some kind of thing. In no, I mean usually the way this goes is that the default features have what you want. Um, Surdy is a little bit special because the derived feature brings in some fairly heavy dependencies, namely the syn crate, um, and it's such a fundamental piece of like infrastructure library that it usually ends up really low in dependency graphs. And so you really want people to only get this if they truly need it so that you could have these like, um, well, it, if you had derive on by default, everyone would bring it in even though they don't need it. Uh, and you really want people to signal that they need it to bring in this heavy dependency. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so... For the most part, default should work. Yeah, I, I think I feel like it's relatively rare that you need to disable default features, and it or it's extremely rare actually that you need to disable um, default features. You sometimes have to add additional features, um, which is the case, for example, with uh, with Surdy that you need to enable it. But that's usually because the the feature is somewhat heavy. Like if you look at Tokyo, for example, the asynchronous runtime. That's another example where by default, it only brings in like uh, types and traits. And you basically need to set features for adding anything else. Like if you want IO support, that's a feature. If you want networking support, that's a feature. If you want time support, that's a feature. Um, and the, the reason you do that is so that you don't incur compile time complexity, as in just like compile time increases, like actual wall clock time increases uh, for for your users. Um, like this is the same thing with Surdy, right? If if it, they defaulted to including the derived feature, everyone's compile times would be longer and it's not necessarily necessary. I think what Surdy is probably getting at is if you have a library or an application that just wants to take types that you're then going to serialize or deserialize, but you don't actually use deserialize to serialize yourself, then there's no reason for you to use the feature. 
And so you'd rather save that in your compile time. Okay. That, that clears things up for me. I think that makes sense. Okay. Um, I think that's all. And we definitely went over our time. I really appreciate you uh, actually, uh, yeah, taking all the time we have to, uh, to, to deal with this. Maybe, uh, no, is there of anything- course. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to chat more if there are other questions you really wanted to get to. I really appreciate your time. Uh, is there anything like, so as being an educator, maybe this is kind of my, I, a great final question to have. Um, because I think the audience that I'm looking for is people kind of around my area or maybe things that they just don't, don't know yet, right? Like about future floods and how to actually detect those. Um, like, is there any like tips or tricks that you think beginners or even now that your book has intermediate people, of course they should get the book, right? Um, but I'm just trying to think, is there anything kind of quick that you wanted to say, hey, you should look at this or do that or any kind of things that you wanted to, to shout out to people? I think maybe the one thing I would say is there are a lot of things to learn in Rust. Like not only is it a language that's fairly different from other languages and requires you to like grapple with concepts that you don't need to know in other languages, but it's also like, because it's a, such a, a type heavy language, there are just a lot of things to wrap your head around. Like there are complex function signatures, trait bounds, like send and sync and lifetimes and asynchronous executors and F of I and no, like there's just, there's a lot of stuff uh, in Rust and you don't need to know it all. And you certainly don't need to know it all in order to be productive. You don't need to know it all in order to be able to write real things in Rust. It's okay to like pick things up sort of as you go. Um, and so I, I think I would encourage people to not get um, discouraged by feeling like they're still beginners or there's a lot they don't know. Like there's a lot I don't know either, and that's okay. You can still be productive and, and then just learn the bits that you need. Um, and I think as an add-on to that, don't feel like you can't help people learn Rust because you don't know it fully yourself either. Like I've learned a lot about Rust over the past many years doing the streams that I didn't know when I started. And I still started teaching the things that I did know. And I would encourage more people to do that. If you, if you feel like you learned something, whether whether you consider that simple or not, like teach someone else about it too. Write a blog post, do a video, do a podcast. It doesn't like tweet about it. It doesn't really matter. But just, I think the more people we get out there trying to teach things in their unique way and with their own words, the the easier it's going to be to pick up the language because you don't want all of the education to come from a, from a small number of people because realistically what you end up with is only one or two teaching voices. People learn different ways. They learn from different kinds of um, formats and different times, types of explanations. And so get yours out there too. And it doesn't really matter if it, you're trying to teach this one thing that you just learned and you don't know if anyone else cares or if anyone else doesn't know it or it's already explained in a million places. You can help add to that by teaching yourself. And I, I want more people to, to do that, even if it's for, for smaller things that they learn when they're first getting started. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay. Yeah, that's very similar to, to what I and I think uh, Luca also said was like, don't try to learn everything. Just focus on the things that are relatable to you. And then maybe sometimes venture yep. outside that just to kind of get a, a more understanding. Yeah, I, I, think that, I think that's really important. Um, and I think it's something that we are getting a little bit better at, but it's worth repeating over and over again. And especially from those of us who, um, sort of have a voice in the Rust community that that's a little bit, that, that rings a little louder, whether that's for good reason or not. Like, I think it's important that we put it out there that it's okay to still be learning. Like we all are too. None of us are perfect developers. We don't know everything. And even though we say things, we may be wrong. Like, uh, one thing I really liked about working with David on the book um, was that he has this this great take on on teaching and on the Rust ecosystem that we probably got a bunch of things wrong in the ways that things currently work in the idiomatic stuff that's explained in the book. Like it might be that ten years from now, completely different patterns are the norm, and that's good. Like we want people to question the status quo and to like come up with their own solutions and and new techniques and stuff, that's good. Don't just take whatever we say as like, this is the assumed wisdom and this is correct. Go out and like try your own way and maybe it pans out, maybe it doesn't, but like 
it, it's okay to 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 walk your own path and at your own pace. Yeah, I think that's uh, really great, really great way to wrap it up. Um, is there anything else you wanted to kind of give a shout out to? Obviously, maybe you want to kind of plug your book again, let people know where to get it. Uh, anything else besides that? No, I th- I think at this point I've I've uh, screamed about my book enough that uh, I don't think people need to hear it again. Um, but no, it's been fun. I, I hope I hope uh, people listening to this feel like there's some value in in hearing me uh, t- talk more about things. I do a lot of talking about things. <laughs> I don't think you talk so much about yourself on on the podcast, which could be good, could be bad, right? But I think it's good to yeah, kind of say, you know, this is who John is, right? Because not everybody watches your YouTube, like you said. You know, you're going to find people who only listen to podcasts, and that's 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 fine, true. Right? So it's good to kind of get you out there a little bit more. And not, of course, not everybody's following the RFCs and everything else too. Uh, for me, I don't follow this at all. I just hear you guys on the podcast um, and watch a couple of your videos. And and um, the, yeah, I always was a little bit discouraged when I hear it's like, oh, this is new feature, and then you're explaining it. And to me, like I, my mind is just blown about what you're even talking about. But at the same time, it's like, okay, you know, uh, maybe I need to dig my head down more and, and understand a little bit more. But it's, it sounds interesting. Well, I I think for the for the videos. Like they are intended to be like for people who already know they want to know, learn the thing that the title of the video is, right? Like subtyping invariance is the one that I keep coming back to where it's a fairly involved topic. Most people don't know why they should care. And that's okay. Like if you start watching it and you don't really care or it seems weird or uninteresting, then stop watching. That's okay. Um, It is for a sort of niche uh, technical audience, and maybe one day that will be you. Like one one day, this will actually come up, and you'll want to or need to to learn about it, and then go watch it again. But you shouldn't feel like you need to watch all of them or or learn everything that's in there because you don't. Like there's a bunch of stuff I've done videos on that most people don't need to know, um, and, and that's okay. I'm just about on the podcast when you talk about new features, and then like I, I forgot what what, what the, like like let's say you're talking about the wrapping, right? Like. Like I asked you straight up, like, why would I want to wrap something? This doesn't make sense in my mind. Oh, yeah. When, when we talk about new Rust releases and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, we try, uh, both Ben and I, to, to sort of articulate why these various features are are useful in some, in some, um, in some meaningful sense. But yeah, it's tough, right? It's, it's a general purpose programming language, which means that there are people using it for all sorts of things. And usually... There's like always someone who has some weird, bizarre need that most people don't. And Rust tries to cater to all of that. And and I don't mean that in the sense of like the standard library has everything, but rather that the language is complete in what it does offer. Like we want to provide all of the convenience methods on slices because it's a fundamental type and you really want to make sure you haven't missed some really important use case that shouldn't need to be in a separate library. Um, you want to make the standard library really deep on the things that it does cover. This is why there are like 40 methods and 20 traits implemented on option, even though option is a very simple type. Yeah, I, I would love to dig down deeper into into types with you because you did talk a lot about types in here. So I'm, I'm guessing you must know those, those uh, pretty well in the implementation. Types are great. I, I, yeah. lo- I love type system encoding. It's uh, It's great. Yeah, maybe we can we can schedule another episode later on about about that because that's that's a super interesting topic I think like especially implementing traits and stuff. It's such a Rust is so unique in, in the fact that they don't have necessarily oop right. They have this weird like struct, but you can implement functions on it, which is just not very. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's really weird. Uh, it's like it's like not a oop language, but it's also not like a functional language to a certain well, extent. Well, it's it's funny because to me at this point like. That is a much more intuitive programming model than object-oriented programming ever was to me. Um, like it, it makes sense to me that you have things and then you have behaviors that those things can have, and the two are sort of separate. And that's what you get with types and traits. Um, and, and I like that way of expressing it because I, I think they are disconnected, uh, whereas object-oriented tends to lead to this like inheritance hierarchy that. It doesn't always make sense. Like you end up with weird layers of abstraction and and things that get related when they don't need to be, and it's often hard to like resolve where a thing belongs. It it gets weird to me, but 
that's also because I've been doing Rust now for a very long time. Well, the only weird thing to me is like, I think I was trying to use SQL X in a project and like it wasn't working for like this connect method, but I had to actually uh, use connection, which was like a trait somewhere. And then all of a sudden, oh, it's been implemented. Uh, that, 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 yeah. Method. So, that's so I mean, that's part. a common, that's a common misconception amongst, uh, I think, especially newer Rust programmers is like, why do I have to use a trait in order to make use of it? Um, and the answer is because, Otherwise, if you say dot foo, the compiler has no way to know which foo you meant, right? Like there might be hundreds of traits in your dependency tree that have a method called foo, and you need to tell it which one. And that can either be by bringing the trait into scope by writing use, or it can be to like explicitly name it. So instead of like dot foo, you write like this trait colon colon foo, and you pass in the arguments. But either way, you need to tell the compiler one way or the other. Um, and the most common way is to just bring that trait into scope. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Uh, we can just keep going on and on. And uh, <laughs> it's my morning. It's it's your night, right? So I, I as much as I want to keep going, uh, I think you know we should we should probably come back to this in the time. Uh, again, yeah, that thank makes you sense. so much for your for your time. Um, yeah. So I hope I have you back on again soon. Maybe once the book actually comes out, and maybe we can talk about some more deeper topics. I think it's. There's some definitely some interesting stuff we can we can bring to to the channel that people maybe don't know or, or could be interested in. Yeah, thanks. It's been great, and uh, and uh, I guess uh, realistically, people listening will hear me again soon, whether with you or or just in a regular episode. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thanks again for coming on. That was great. Thanks, Alan. Bye.